All right, Zach, we cleaned this place up. Looks good, man. Yeah, looking a little better, right? Kind of looks like a fun <laughs> studio. How about we sit down and do a little interview time now that we've spent some time on the job, we've seen your shop, how you organize things. I mean, you are literally the most organized, efficient guy I've ever met. It's re been really fun to spend a couple days with you. It's been great having you. I've really enjoyed it. But let's, let's sit down now and let's tell these guys what the opportunity is for young people in the carpentry trade what it looks like, what's the pay scale, what's the path. You know, I know there's multiple paths. Uh, let's spend a little time kind of digging into your past. Sound good? Let's do it. All right, guys, we're talking trades, we're talking carpentry. Build Original Series, hosted by Matt Reisinger. Talking Trades, brought to you by Front Door and Sashco. All right, Zach, so first off, we talked a little bit about your uh, uh, your roots in the trade, and I think you're so fascinating that you got started at such a young age as a carpenter. But let's let's take a step back and think about other people that you know that are in your same trade. Uh, talk to me about the uh, the path. You know, I know there's a million paths to get to where you are today, but what do you foresee for the high schoolers maybe watching this? What's a way that they can get into the carpenter trade? I think there's a couple different roads to doing it and like you said there's no right way mm -hmm. but i think the road looks a lot different now than it did when i started because of all the information that's available um that wasn't available to my generation that's a great point um i was sort of my world was the tradespeople i worked with mm -hmm. and the opportunities that were within that world yep. um and i feel like i would have hit the ground running a little quicker had i known um what was possible and some of the projects that were being built that maybe were a little more complex or a little more well-designed than what I was actually working on. Yeah, yeah, um, more well thought out, let's say. Yeah, more sure. durable, right? Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I still think education's important. You know, uh, I never graduated college, but I did do six years um, in various college programs mm -hmm. after I, uh, graduated yeah. from homeschooling, yeah. but I was still running my remodeling company, so I only went to college part-time. But just that critical thought is hugely important, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people um, think of the trades as a alternative to college, mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily think you, you can throw out one without the other, because a lot of the skills I learned make me a more well-rounded carpenter, and I have more critical thought. Yeah, So right. I, I definitely think some sort of Higher education, even if it's small, helps you helps you at least break away from whatever your parents taught you. Yeah. No matter what your parents taught you, sure. having that diluted information from other people is, is extremely valuable and that definitely helped me. Yeah, I would agree. But to get into the trade specifically, I think there's always passion, but you really have to rely on, if you want to make money, you have to rely on your competencies. What is mm -hmm. what is easier for Zach to do? than other people and go after that. And for me, what, what's easier is to look at something, understand how it's assembled, how it works, and then make it. Mm -hmm. I've always been taking my toys apart from a young age, t taking buildings apart, doing the work in my parents' house, and that really lent itself to building homes because not only do I like uh, to do the physical work, but it's really enjoyable to, um, learn about plumbing, learn about HVAC, follow people like you and learn about high performance building mm -hmm. and how vapor travels in different climate zones. Yeah. And I think, you know, that curiosity is what makes me good at my job. I think that's a great point. You yeah. know, that, that, uh, that lifetime learning, you know, it doesn't go away just because we don't go to college, let's say, doesn't mean we don't stop learning. And in fact, I think for you and I, a big part of our success has been work all day and then at night when we've got some free time that's where we do our learning right and sometimes that's youtube sometimes that's been trade magazines uh sometimes maybe that that is truly a a college class or a, a graduate class especially as you and i have run businesses too uh you know my guess is you've had to learn a lot more than just carpentry you've probably had to learn quickbooks you've had to <laughs> learn spreadsheets you've had to learn all these other systems to manage your business uh, which is far more than just running a, a chop saw. Yeah, for sure. Now, you and I don't have uh, a union background, but I'm curious if you know the union carpenter path and can give any advice for folks that 
might be in a place where they could, they could join a union apprentice type program for carpentry. So I don't have firsthand experience. A lot of the tradespeople I work with come in and out of the unions because we're located right now. We're sitting, you know, eight miles outside Manhattan. So there's a lot of union work in the city. Um, but I don't have any on the job understanding. But I think there are certain people who maybe are l more risk averse than I am mm -hmm. that um, will thrive in a union environment because uh, you can you, you can start, you can sort of pay your dues, work your way up, and um, the union's going to watch out for you and they're going to take care of you and you're probably going to have um, a, a more reasonable income without having to learn QuickBooks, without mm -hmm. having to learn how to run a business. So that probably allows you to pick up a hobby, which I don't have a lot of, right? <laughs> probably gives you a little bit more free time. However, um, you are somewhat at the mercy in certain unions to not having work because uh, it waxes and wanes. And a lot of the uh, trade partners I hire have a union background and decided to start their own business because of that frustration they were having with, with sort of the lack of consistent workflow coming through the union. So yeah, that's, interesting. that's something I've, I've heard, uh, but I can't speak to it personally, but I, I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity there, especially if you're not the type of person who wants to be having all of these dis different disciplines that it, that it takes to run a business and you just want someone advocating for you. And that's, I think that's a wonderful thing. I'm curious, you know, we met Kaylin, one of your apprentice carpenters. He's really a true carpenter now. He's kind of graduated from that apprentice position. When you think about Kayla when you first met him, what qualities really stood out to you for him thinking about a job with you and you going, I think this would be a good person to hire as an apprentice? And I'm, I'm thinking, how do we translate that to our viewers? What, what qualities do you look for in a young carpenter and a young apprentice? I think I look for the curiosity and like a, a, a wide range of knowledge about how things are going to work because if you're doing carpentry, you're obviously doing math, you're doing geometry, um, and a genuine curiosity about how that works mm -hmm. serves you well, and you have to understand how different species of wood will react to weather and moisture. Yeah. And so all of those variables lend it to when I ask questions about things, a lot of people will, a lot of carpenters will freeze up and say, if you, you know, do you cope? or miter your crown is the question. <laughs> and what's the correct answer? <laughs> and the correct answer is, it depends. Uh -huh. And uh, if someone says cope, they're probably not a good fit. If someone says miter, they're probably not a good fit. That's but funny. if they say, well, is this pre-finished crown? Then I'm mitering. Right. Is this unfinished crown? Then I'm coping. Mm -hmm. what, what type of wood is it? Yeah. Um, is it a small crown? How much is the budget? That's <laughs> right? awesome. Yeah. Um, so he's, he has all of those uh, traits of being someone who's curious and, and interested. And he also has enough confidence to put his all into a task um, and not self-doubt. Because um, in remodeling, you're rarely using the same molding in the same house more than once. I, yeah. um, I know there's probably production carpenters who work at similar houses, maybe um, like repetitive models, but that doesn't exist in my uh, area of work, right? There's, yeah. there's, no, there's no land, right? So, yeah. so you're not building the same house twice. So you really have to be uncomfortable. You have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And doing different things. Doing all the different time. things and being close to your vehicle, far from your vehicle. Sometimes you have all your tools. Sometimes you have a screwdriver, and you yeah. got to make it work. So um, it's that flexibility, and then it's also um, you almost need to be uh, ridiculously positive. If you come in with a bad That's attitude, a the job. Um, the gruelingness, the fact that you're out in the weather year-round, that's, that's enough to dampen, literally dampen your body, but dampen your spirits. Yeah. And if you're not showing up every day with a good attitude, um, then, you're, then you're just going to be miserable. That's a great point. And so I need to, it, it's almost unreasonable optimism. It has to be, 
it has to be almost manufactured. Mm -hmm. And I look for that a lot because I, I don't have the bandwidth as a manager to um, work through your problems every single day and what's going on with your father and you know his hips bothering him and it made you late. There's a time for that, yeah. but I do need you to be positive and show up because there will be hard days yeah. And that positivity is what's going to get you through because, um, unfortunately, our trade doesn't compensate you uh, fairly when compared to other uh, white-collar jobs. And not only that, but you're not going to have the sort of leniency in your day-to-day -day schedule. You're not going to get an hour lunch. Right. You're not going to get to hang, play on your phone and know that there's a salary there for you. That's Those are... <laughs> you know, fireable infractions in our industry. Yeah. So if, if you're negative about it, uh -huh. it the job's going to get you down. It's not going to work. Yeah, 100%. But if you love it, it's going to be the best job ever. And when you see someone commuting in a suit and sitting inside in their office on a freezing day, you're going to think, I, I pity that person who's, totally. who's in there and uh, isn't experiencing the cold air and is probably getting a cold from their coworker, <laughs> you know? Yes. You know, Mike Rowe uh, is a bit of a legend in this, uh, uh, in his Dirty Job series yeah. for promoting jobs that are not white collar office jobs. And so many of us have this, this like, go Mike feeling. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, you know, a good, a good portion of what we've been doing on Talking Trades, I feel like is in response to what he started. But he's got, I, this is not an exact quote, but I've heard him talk about uh, how we have this kind of imaginary job in our mind as maybe a high school student that's, um, uh, you know, this career that's out there that's perfect for me, that I'm going to just fall in love with it and I'll be awesome at it. And he kind of talks about how there's so many jobs in the world, including, I think, carpentry, where you may not know that you're going to love it, but you get out there and you do it. And in time, you grow to absolutely love it. Uh, and I think that's been my career path a little bit too, where as I've become a builder, I don't think if I was a high schooler, even though I worked some construction jobs, I don't think I would have said I was passionate about construction and would love it. And yet here I am, th almost 30 years in uh, the construction world, I'm super passionate about what I do. I love building houses. I love the sense of accomplishment. I wonder if your path uh, is similar. Like when you were in high school, you're a little different because you really started your company very young. But did you expect to be passionate about that now that you're in your 30s? Uh, or did that come in time, that passion for craft, that excitement for doing things a little better each time and for learning new things? I think I think maybe I'm a little peculiar, but I've always had that. I, I sort of knew from eight on that I wanted to work with my hands and I wanted to build my own house at some mm. point. And it's always interested me. And the only times I wanted to walk away from it were where I was doing the things that I was bad at, which were mainly financial. Mm. So if I was working for a client who was mean, then I was having a bad time. Or mm. if I was working for a client and I didn't charge enough and I was losing money, then I was having a bad time. Mm. If I was uh, you know, working through an injury or uh, working late on QuickBooks, having a bad time. Yeah. But I've never had a bad experience doing the carpentry itself. It's always the burden of doing tasks I'm mediocre at that has made my career tough. Interesting. But I've never uh, had a, a bad day on the tools because of the tools or because of the weather or because yeah. The, yeah. the wood wasn't straight or whatever it was. It's always... Um, doing something that I'm bad at. Yeah. And um, my, big, my big challenge now is how do I build a company strong enough so I can bring in people who can have that same passion I have for carpentry, mm -hmm. but for QuickBooks right. or for right. uh, client invoicing for or whatever it is. that you're not great at. Exactly, yeah. so we can all succeed together. Mm -hmm. um, let's get down to the brass tacks a little bit. What, what opportunity is there for high school kids in terms of what could they make on either an hourly or maybe an annual basis, starting out in this field from what you've seen, both in, in your kind of metropolitan area or maybe your friends across, across the country, and then where can they get to over five or 10 years? So I would say um, we're, we're gonna talk about being an employee, mm -hmm. uh, not being a sub 
subtrade, but you're going to Let's be, talk both, really. All right, so you're going to be able to start um, at probably no skill, around 18 an hour, I would think, mm -hmm. picking up trash, sweeping, and absorbing as much information as you can yeah. from those tradespeople. Eventually, you're going to be holding the end of the tape. Eventually, you're going to start picking up, uh, you're going to be able to use a saw, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's pretty easy to move someone to 20 an hour um, who picks up the skills of being able to use a drill, drive screws, yep. can start putting a tool belt on, for sure. laying out 16 on an inch centers for, for framing. Um, you're gonna push into 22 when you basically got the hand, hand tools mastered and you're able to be left on a job and understand how to clean up mm -hmm. and be trustworthy into 25. Um, you're able to accomplish tasks on your own that are pretty, not super high stakes, but you know maybe run some bays, yep. patch and floor sand, prep things. Um, moving into 28 territory, you should be able to be laying out stairs, understand stringers is sort of, uh, I think stairs are a great um, tipping point from that, that sort of uh, apprentice carpenter to carpenter because you have to understand the floor thicknesses and a lot yeah. of people mess it up. So I think, you know, if you could say, hey, build this little deck and stairs and do it productively, mm -hmm. meaning um, you should be able to do a task like that a day alone. Right, in a pace. Yeah, yeah. at a good pace um, is important. Uh, unfortunately, there, the downfall of a lot of carpenters is they want to do the more glamorous thing. So they want to do the steps. They want to do all that stuff. Mm. They want to do the crown molding, but they don't really want to do all their cuts at once. Mm. They don't want to put the garbage can next to the miter saw right. because then your off cuts are going there. So instead of being an effective worker, they're doing what they're seeing people do on Instagram. They're, they're doing the work, but they're not applying a process to it, mm. which is how we make the money to pay them. That's how we pay That's the right. workman's compensation. Yeah. Aside from uh, this, this junior carpenter uh, needing to learn skills and earn their keep, they're trying to pay a workman's comp uh, insurance line item that's much larger than their white collar. So it's mm. like hitting us when we're down, right? right? So uh, $21 of every 100 I'm paying these employees is going whoosh, right to workman's compensation. Wow. So there's there's this there's this massive um, uh, responsibility on their shoulders right away. Mm -hmm. And as they make more, that responsibility grows. They need mm -hmm. to be exponentially more productive effective. and right. effective. And so that's that really puts us at a huge disposition. And that's why you see a lot of people hiring people off the books and coming up with ways around following the rules. Mm -hmm. And then that drives the whole quality of the industry down and gives yeah. us a bad bad name because not yeah. everyone is playing by the same rules. Yeah. Now, it's important to know that certain states are better about forcing people to play by the same rules yeah. than other states. That's right. So uh, in New Jersey, they're not great about that. Mm. So um, this, it, for whoever's watching this, this may not be directly relevant to what's, what's the case in their state. But in general, you do, as an employee, have the right to be covered by workman's compensation should you hurt yourself. You also have the obligation to your employer to work safely, and your employer has the obligation to protect you. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, yeah. the first thing a lot of uh, employers would like to do is not provide you with PPE, not protect you because they have had a lot of turnover because they don't run good businesses and they're really not worried about your long-term health. They're worried about uh, making enough money so they can take care of their family. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but let's keep going. So as, as you frame those stairs, you're getting 28. The next thing is you're probably pushing into 30 and you're beginning to I like to to think of my carpenters as you're you're backing away from the project, right? Like when I hired you, it was like there's dust on the floor and there's a broom, and then it was 
oh, there's some tools. And it was like, I can do something with this tool. That's a great explanation. And then now we're getting further away. Oh, I'm going to accomplish this task of this job. Uh -huh. And now, um, oh, look, at there's all these other people working here. We've yeah. got... We've got plumbers, so right. we're backing up a little bit more. And now you're a lead carpenter it, and you're managing all those yeah, people so as well as doing your trade. When you're jumping from 30 to 40, all of a sudden you're saying, I, I, I don't need to think about what I'm doing right now. I need to think about what's happening tomorrow mm -hmm. so I can order this material now. Yeah. What's happening next week? That's right. What are we doing now to get ahead a month, mm -hmm. two months, six months, yeah. two years? Yeah. And so as the pay increases, the further you're getting back, and probably by the time um, you're, you're going to make a split at some point. You're either going to take the route of being a skilled tradesperson in one discipline, and you're going to become so good and competent at that, that you're going to push into the 67 to $87 range per hour, mm -hmm. and you're going to be just an A-level cabinet installer, an yeah. A-level plumbing tech an A-level electrician, an mm -hmm. A-level carpenter, someone who I can send to a 4,000 square foot house and pay $87 an hour and know that they're gonna productively pretty much trim that thing themselves yep. and I don't need to look at it. Yep. And they're gonna make a good living. They're gonna yeah. make $100,000, which here isn't really a good living, unfortunately, but they're gonna make six figures. Yeah. But they're going to be and they're still hustling. employees at that point, right? So that that's still not even the hassles of dealing with QuickBooks at night and getting new customers, and right. all that sort of thing. Although the work could vary in terms of uh, uh, you know always having uh, work to do in a paycheck, right? Well, because these aren't salary jobs. They're not salary jobs, but since oh eight, I haven't seen someone with those type of skills. It's a great point. Ever it's a great point. not have work it's a for great a point. day. So here we are. <laughs> almost, what is that? 15, in the last 15 years, you and I have seen those really A-level carpenters never miss a day of work. And in fact, if there was a job slowdown, there's five other people that would love to have them uh, on that job to, uh, to work for them, right? Right. And I could see um, the economy take a turn for the worse and it being slightly tougher, but we're at such a deficit right now. Huge. I could see people say, who are at an $87 an hour mark right now saying, man, I'm gonna have to charge 67. Mm -hmm. But they're still gonna survive. In the bad times, costs come down, Yeah. right? Yeah. We, we all make it through together, but I can't imagine they're gonna be sitting home. Yeah. And, uh, or, so you, you, get, you get good at one thing, and I think that's a great, that that's a great quality of life for a lot of people mm -hmm. who don't who want to have a life outside of work. Let's that's put right. it that right. Yeah. Right. If you want to have a life, be present for your kids, uh, be a good spouse. I think that's a great route. I agree. I, agree. I and that's a, that's easily a route to make six figure income. Easily. Now, if you want to make double that six figure income, what's the path to get there in, in carpentry? I think if you want to double is you're going to keep backing away and you're going to keep having more people under you in larger projects yep. and you're going to try setting those people up for success. That's yep. sort of where I'm at now where um, there are people who are working for me that I'm teaching, but I'm also looking at my projects in terms of months and years out. How are we framing this so that the tile guy who shows up in six months is going to be successful? Yep. And if we can shave two days off that timeline, maybe we're fixed costs, maybe my tile person will charge less. Yep. I'm gonna keep that profit. The client's gonna get the job on time. The, the, the professional photos are gonna look better than mm -hmm. my competition because mm -hmm. my competition isn't gonna have the layout as good. Yep. And that's, that's the other route. The, the problem with that is if you're not someone who enjoys the complexity of constantly learning, and being wrong a lot of the time, uh, then then you're going to be frustrated. Yeah, <laughs> right. For sure. I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned uh, that kind of. I love that analogy of this is my task, and as I back away, I make I'm more valuable. I make more money, and then there is that final jump back where you're looking at the job from the street. Yeah, and that's kind of where you and I are now. And I'm I'm 15 years older than you probably, so I've got a a bigger team. <laughs> You're looking at the say, job from the highway. <laughs> right, I look at the job from the highway, that's right. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you want to make uh, 200000 300000 a year, there is a path for that, and it starts in, a lot of that starts in carpentry. I'm, I'm not 
Uh, I didn't take that path. I'm a slightly unusual builder, uh, but I would suspect that at least 50% of the really successful builders I know who do the really detailed, the really cool, the really interesting jobs, they got their start just like you, uh, making 18 bucks an hour as a carpenter, uh, and less than half of them, I suspect, have a college degree. Uh, I happen to have a college degree, and I thought I was going to get into auto manufacturing, uh, and had worked construction consistently for many summers. And so when I graduated from college, I couldn't find a job in manufacturing like I thought. It was kind of a downtime uh, in the 90s. The economy was not awesome. I went into construction and I followed the opportunity, uh, which is kind of Mike Rose quote, you know, follow the opportunity, the passion and the money will come. And that's my story. I worked hard. I followed the opportunity and the passion is absolutely there for me. But I think following your path, following that path of a carpenter, uh, and, and getting better and better at that trade and backing up further and further, there's at least 50% of the amazing builders that I can think of that have taken that path and have been super successful, run very big businesses. Now, it's not the same path they thought they were going to take, maybe, right? Uh, as an 18 or a 25 or a 35 year old. Uh, but now that I'm 50, uh, you know, as a builder, I make great money. I also get to work with, which is really fun, the $80 an hour carpenters. Right. Uh, and some of my uh, favorite uh, job site interactions, favorite friends that I go to soccer games with are those $80 an hour carpenters. They're just the salt of the earth, amazing men and women that are so detailed, they care about what they do. And as a builder, I think that my superpower is having those people on the job because when they leave the job, that's where the hidden doors come from. Yeah. That's where the really awesome staircases are. Like I remember watching your video about a staircase you did not long ago on one of your jobs that I was blown away. Like that's the coolest staircase. And that all started with a really good carpenter, yeah. right? So I think so much of what we do and so much of what people connect with in our industry is really good carpentry work. I was thinking about that the other day because I got a, um, I got a call from a local, uh, uh, builder who was like, Matt's in town. Oh my gosh. And his, his jobs are superior to mine in many ways. His budgets are bigger. And, um, and I was thinking like, man, to be him and to have his success financially and the complexity of his jobs, it's gotta be like, why is Matt Reisinger visiting that, that like college dropout carpenter? <laughs> and, and I think it's, it's, it's about, um, you're here because like I've been committed to, day one to this trade mm -hmm. and you like I've never followed the money I followed the opportunity that's right but and the money came and the money came and I think I think another thing we sh we have to discuss is uh, social media is great for educating people mm -hmm. but you're gonna have a lot of success in social media if you are pumping up financial gains if you're pumping mm -hmm. up the greatest great tool point. and I I like to tell the story of I've had all these insecurities about being a carpenter. Carpenters are way cooler now than they were when I started. It's a great point. It was, I remember going to parties, telling people what I did, and then being like, cool, and backing away. And then mm -hmm. it was sort of like, oh, look look who's wearing Carhartt. Mm -hmm. You know, look what's fashionable now. And the DIY movement came out, <laughs> and everyone was like, oh, you're a carpenter? You know, That's I so cool. check out this pallet furniture I made. And I was like... <laughs> I could I could have made that if I was you know with my eyes closed like that's not craftsmanship. I made that when I was fifteen. Yeah, like that's so not exciting. It's cool now, but you have to understand that you know your path is your path, yeah, and yeah. whether you are are right. the 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 guy who shows up on the job in the trunk full of poop to pump out that Porter John, you're more impactful to the job's success than the architect is at that point. Yeah, if you right. don't show up, literally people are walking off that job yeah. and you have to, you have to you know, ignore the hierarchy mm -hmm. and figure out what, what your success looks like. And I, I, I think that's, that's this sort of toxic uh, you know, stereotype we have to kind of continue to push through is yeah. that if you want to top out mm -hmm. at a certain skill set because for whatever reason, that's totally fine. Yeah. And I'm yeah. I'm coming to that now where I, you know, I pushed myself, how am I gonna get that ten million dollar job? How am I gonna get that five million dollar job? The truth is, I, Zach's never gonna get it. I'm never gonna get it alone. 
yeah. I need to find people with. And I would say that, that too, for you too, Zach, that's not necessarily the measure of success. And I've done a lot of those multi-million dollar jobs. And uh, when you peek under the covers, they're not as exciting as you think they are. Right. Uh, and in fact, I've kind of wanted to scale my home building business back to the more normal sized <laughs> projects and more everyday budgets. Now I'm not doing, uh, you know, uh, small budget things, but still there is that jump that people kind of like what you said, that you see it on Instagram, you see people doing it, you can get jealous of it. Uh, quick story about that. And, and I want to ask you about blue collar, white collar after this, but, uh, I have a, when I first started my home building company, there was a builder who was about 10 years younger than me that I always saw as more successful. He always dressed in really nice clothes. He had like a suit he'd wear. Uh, he was the president of the Home Builders Association. He drove a Range Rover. Uh, he seemed to be just killing it in his business. And I was always like, God, that guy is so successful. Range Rover, peak quality, right? <laughs> yeah, terrible, frankly. I hate Range Rovers. I'll drive a Toyota any day. Long story short, I've, I've always dressed like this. I've always worn just a regular black button down and jeans and mm. work boots. And and so for a little while, though, I was trying to dress like him. Like I wore nice loafers. I'd destroy him on the job and have to buy another <laughs> pair. I felt like an idiot. I'd wear like button downs. My wife was like, you look terrible on that. What are you doing? Well, I'm, you know, I'm trying to, trying to look the part of this right. successful builder. Well, long story short, during the recession, that guy was all facade and no, uh, his business crumbled. He left a bunch of subs in the lurch, including some of the subs I worked with that he didn't pay. He had to move out of town because he left all these people in a shambles and, you know, w declared chapter 11. And here I was just struggling along uh, as a young builder, working long hours and trying to make my business work. But it reminded me that just because people portray something to the world, whether it's Instagram, whether it's their beautiful website, that's not necessarily always the truth, right? right? And the truth is somewhere in between there. And I think what makes you and I successful uh, is not just what car we drive, where we live, our house, our businesses. But for me, one of the things I love about the trades and talking about the trades, and you mentioned earlier, is that you can have a great life and still have hobbies. Uh, I've been married for almost 25 years. I have four kids that get to see me. You know, I travel a little more today. I'm, I'm in New Jersey rather than back in Texas. But I was around for dinner every single night when my kids were young. And I made it a point to be home at six o'clock for dinner. We always had dinner at six. I was always there. I think that's something that, that happens in the trades that doesn't always happen for those men and women that put a suit on and take the train into New York City. And I'm curious, I'm tra transitioning here. Uh, you mentioned it a little bit, but what do you have to say for the young person watching this on that kind of blue collar, white collar thing? Like, is there, how do they overcome that? Is there still, is there lesser animosity these days than there was in the past? What do you think about that? I think it depends really. I think there's probably just as much, um, I don't know if it's animosity, but there is uh, a separation. Mm -hmm. There's a clear mm -hmm. line we've drawn in the sand right. between when right. you, when you are on this side of blue collar mm -hmm. and um, there's a stigma there for sure. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've felt that manifested in conversations with uh, interior designers about budget specifically. That's interesting. So we'll, the interior designer is, uh, has no credentials necessarily because that's something that you could just sort of decide. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and their billable rate it vastly out, uh, exceeds what my carpenters are getting paid. Uh, and they'll, cavalierly throw around the term like, wow, you guys are so expensive because they'll, you know, oh, I, what if we did, you know, uh, inset handles here? Well, you know, I'll probably add 400 bucks per handle because we had a mortise, it's finished, we had to repaint the door. You're so expensive. <laughs> and it's and it's very, it's very demeaning and it's uh, very uh -huh. hurtful because yeah. it's like, we're we're not expensive. We're making way less than you. Yep. And and we would never say that because we're not, in a, we're not empowered to say that also it would be offensive to you. We're to saying, you. what value are you adding right now? <laughs> well, I'll go pick out a handle. I could do it. You know, I could, I could guess and I'd be Why close. Why are you 150 you, an hour? Yeah, if you wanted to do this, you'd have to figure out how a router works first. Right. It, there's much steeper learning curve yeah. and we're getting compensated yeah. uh, worse. Yeah. So there's definitely like a clear, a clear line there, but also it's always an inside job. 
Like mm -hmm. your self value and worth, it's always going to be coming from you. That's right. And so yep. you have to do whatever work it takes to be comfortable with yourself. And if it means unfollowing some accounts that is 100%. a new guy who's you know driving over a Lamborghini with a crusher, mm -hmm. uh, you know, while lighting a suitcase full of cash on fire. <laughs> Maybe that's not what you should be uh, consuming, right? Uh, that's not that maybe is an unrealistic goal uh, for you, but which brings it back to what you said earlier that you have to bring your own weather to the job site, right? You decide that you're going to have a good day today, regardless of whether it's 10 degrees outside, regardless of whatever outside forces are going to act on you, because they're always going to be there. And so you and I have to decide that we're going to have a positive day, that we're going to make it happen, that I'm going to go to work and then I'm going to come home and spend time with my family and I'm not going to be a grump at home. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to be mad because a client's not paying me or because I have this issue. I'm going to be dad. I'm going to be husband. I'm going to be whatever that role is that I need to play at the time, including sometimes, uh, you know, being the builder who's happy to be at work and is glad to see you on my job site. Right. Right. I, absolutely. And you have to I think it's helpful to practice empathy mm -hmm. because if you look at that designer and you think, wow, what a jerk. Or if you look at that designer and say, they're just disappointed that their cool idea is not going to work out. Yeah. And they're seeing you as the reason that the client's not going to pay for it. Yeah. That's not the case. That doesn't take any value away from yeah. me. I'm totally worth that $80 an hour, $100,000, $400,000. I'm as worth as, as much as people are willing to pay for my services. Yeah. And that person's just saying something stupid. They don't mean anything by it. Yeah. We're going to keep moving. That's right. We're not going to go complain to Matt Reisinger about it in an interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, Zach, I want you to hear it from me. Uh, you know, I've known you a long time, but I haven't spent a ton of time with you in person. And spending the last two days with you on the job, in your shop, getting to really spend time with your wife, uh, who works with you in the business, by the way, and meeting your kids. I'm really proud of you, man. You built a fantastic life. Uh, and uh, as opposed to maybe your friends that are commuting into New York City, dealing with all those uh, major stresses in that corporate world, uh, you know, maybe they drive a fancier car, have a fancier house, but I can tell you that they are not as successful in life as you are. And you have been an incredible success at your age. And I'm really excited to see where this continues to take you because you run a great business. You build a great house, you build with integrity, and you're giving a great value to your clients. Uh, and along the way, you build a great life for yourself. I'm really proud to be your friend. Oh man, tears are coming, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> it's been awesome to spend a couple days with you, man. I appreciate that That's so much. Sure. Likewise. Uh, and if you wanna see more and hear more from Zach, he's of course shooting videos on a weekly basis. Uh, he's also uh, absolutely hilarious on Instagram, and I love his van <laughs> videos that he makes while he's driving home or driving to the job site. So go check out Detmore 101 on Instagram and follow Zach. Uh, and like I said, if you've got uh, a young person uh, at home, if you're a mom or dad watching this, sit down and watch this series uh, with them because I think Zach is a great example uh, of someone who uh, graduated from high school, did some college, but maybe didn't graduate from college, and it yet has built a incredible life for himself, for his family. I'm so, as I said earlier, I'm so proud uh, to shoot videos with Zach. Uh, and I think that if you consider a career path that involves carpentry, you could build a similar incredible life to what Zach has done. Guys, it's been a really fun journey with y'all, uh, having a chance to get around the country and see some really talented tradespeople and to see what that trade has brought them, not just for their financial gain, but for their life gain. Uh, I'm really proud to be a part of the Build Show Network uh, that has brought this series to you. And my hope is that now that you've had a chance to watch the series, maybe rewatch it with that high schooler, with that junior high, or maybe even with that elementary school kid who might be on your couch. Because uh, this is a series that we need to get out there and we need more people to see because the the uh, cliff is coming. We've got so many talented tradespeople that are retiring, that have retired, and we need those people. The opportunity in our business, in this construction trade, is vast. And for your young people to consider that trade, we really want them to, uh, to think about this. 
I also do want to make mention that we want you to finish high school if you're watching this and you're a high schooler. Uh, Zach and I use so much of what we learned in high school on a daily basis and carpentry and specifics. Uh, you need some math, right? You need some good math skills. You need to understand how to multiply and do it in your head without having to pull out a calculator. You need to know your all of your multiplication tables. I'm talking to my son here as well. Uh, it's important. So graduate high school. Uh, and the last thing I'd leave you with is carpentry in particular and some of these other trades. There are some availabilities for summer internships or just working in the trade for the summer. Forget the word internship. My 15 year old worked uh, on my work crew as a laborer this summer. And he did everything from picking up jobs to taking trailers to the dump, uh, to shop vacuuming to sweeping. Uh, he got to do some basement waterproofing. And at the end of the uh, summer, he absolutely loved getting a paycheck. Uh, he loved getting dirty and sweaty, even in 100 degree <laughs> Texas heat. And he asked me if he could not go back to school for his sophomore year in high school. And I said, no, no, son, you need to finish high school. It's really important for you to finish high school. When you're done with high school, though, I'd love for you to consider a career in the trades. And that's my hope is that you guys watching this too might pass this series on to those young people who might consider a career in the trades. Guys, really appreciate your time. We'll see you soon. Man, isn't Zach awesome? I had a super fun time hanging out with Zach for a couple days. He has got to be one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Make sure you go follow Zach on social and see his videos on thebuildshow.com. Same is true with all the trades people we visited. But let's wrap up the series really quick. So fun to sit down, hopefully with your teenagers and your young people, to explore this opportunity. I've got some young teens at home that I'm gonna be watching this series with alongside of you. Talk to them about those opportunities. See what local options they've got in their high school to get involved maybe with a trade school program. Talk to a local HVAC, electrical, mechanical company about whether they offer apprentice programs. And I suspect there's lots of opportunities for those young people that if you as an adult sit with them talk to them about that and maybe explore those options, that might be an incredible way for you to help them get into that trade. You know, we've got a lot of great houses that need to build and we need those young people to jump in with us. Our motto at The Build Show is no better, build better, and this fits right in with this. We need those young people to know about these opportunities. So if you enjoyed this series, please pass this along. Let's get a lot of watch time on this and let's get those young people in America to join us in this incredible business. This has been a Build Original Series, Talking Trades. I want to say a huge thanks to my friends at Sashco for sponsoring this Talking Trades series. First off, if you're not familiar with them, Sashco makes a huge line of premium cocks and sealants that I use every day in my high performance builds. They're a family owned company that makes their products in Colorado, but they also have been a massive supporter of trade school education. Now, if you are a trade school teacher watching this video, I want to tell you about their class pack program, which was designed for you to use in your classroom to educate students about sealant technology and application. Now, I've been through a version of this program and it was really fun and educational. You can enhance your curriculum with their expert resources. Learn more at sashco.com backslash trades dash support. Now, if you aren't a teacher, you can still make a difference in this battle to bolster our trade base. Take the Sashco Challenge. Volunteer a local trade school in your town, capture the moment, share it on social media and tag Sashco, and your reward will be a free case of Lexel as a token of their appreciation for supporting trade education. Thanks again, Sashco, for sponsoring these videos. I wanna thank our friends at Front Door for sponsoring this Talking Trade series. If you're not familiar with Front Door, they are reimagining how homeowners maintain and repair their most valuable asset, their home. As the parent company of two leading brands, Front Door brings over 50 years of experience in providing their members with comprehensive options to protect their homes from costly and unexpected breakdowns through their extensive network of pre-qualified professional contractors. American Home Shield has approximately 2 million members and gives homeowners budget protection and convenience, covering up to 23 essential home systems and appliances. Now, Front Door is a cutting edge one stop app for home repair and maintenance. Enabled by their stream technology, the app empowers homeowners by connecting them in real time through video chat with pre qualified experts to diagnose and solve their problems. 
The Front Door app also offers homeowners a range of other benefits, including DIY tips, discounts, and much more. More information about American Home Shield and Front Door, visit frontdoorhome.com. Now, as the largest provider of home service plans in the nation and a network of approximately 16,000 independent contractors, Front Door is spreading the word and advocating to bring new talent into the pipeline by creating opportunities for young people as plumbers, electricians, and other highly skilled professions. Front Door has also been sponsoring organizations committed to the advancement of the skilled trades like Skills USA and Be Pro Be Proud. And lastly, Front Door is launching a new initiative that helps students further explore the skilled trades through a trade along program. Think of it kind of like a take your kid to work day. They will experience a day in the life where they will work alongside a skilled trades professional to see firsthand what it's really like to work in that particular profession. Our hope is that this will continue to encourage young people to join us here in the trades and really fill that gap that we've got of skilled trades people in the younger generation. So thank you so much Front Door for sponsoring this Talking Trade series. And hopefully you, just like the people at Front Door, can encourage that young person to get out there on the job site with you and really see what a day in life in the trades looks like. We'll see you next time.